I love to teach my kids on how to, uh, well, I used to teach my kids how to program Mathematica using little games, and I decided that, uh, you know, Space Invader, which was uh, created in 1979, is the third uh, least complex game uh, ever made, I think, and uh, I decided to show you how to write it in Mathematica in just uh, 10 slides. What we're going to do is, you know, here are the steps. We're going to do simple dynamic graphics, then show sprites, explain what that is, using the keyboard to control the player, moving animated sprites, doing collision explosions, damageable sprites, moving a fleet of aliens, adding sound, and we're going to use a new feature from uh, version 9 it's called Schedule Tasks, and then we'll play the game. So, I hope this is big enough. I'm, you know, the goal here is to have the, the code readable by you all. The big issue, you know, I'm doing, uh, I have a little few variables for the ball here. And the big deal here in this is that I have a graphics and has a dynamic. And the dynamic, ins inside the dynamics, the ball position is changed by the speed. And then here I'm doing some simple calculation to bounce the speed if I hit the walls. I think you've seen that many times. That's about the simple thing you can do. And it does this. I don't have any to do anything else. So that's the most basic, um, so most of the most basic things. So some of the things to know here that might be important to you when you try to control the display uh, of what you're doing is to make sure that you have set the plot range, the image size. In this case, I'm using the background to black so that I don't have to draw the background. It will be black. And then I told two things, you know, the, in most plots, Mathematica likes to add little borders to everything to make things nice, but sometimes you want to control everything so that it's pixel exact, and you want to make sure that every pixel of that you draw is drawn exactly the same way. And so the big trick, uh, which takes years to learn, is to put plot range padding to none and image padding to none, padding to none. So, um, in the end, all those construct here, it's a little bit, you know, this bunch of lines of code, and so I've just created uh, a little function here called SI graphics, and it just sets my plot range and everything here. So I'm going to stop this. Now we're going to do something slightly more complex. So what are sprites? Well, in a video games, sprites are things like this. You know, they are black and white, or color sprites, they are pixels, they are images. Uh, but usually they are simple images, sometimes they are animated. And in this case, how were those made? How did I make those here? Well, it turns out that um, on the internet you can find the source code of Space Invader, and they have the sprites encoded in hexadecimal like this. And so I write some code to just take the hexadecimal and then turn them into rasters. So this is what happened here. So that's how those sprites are. It's actually the reflection of this little hexadecimal here. And we can look at what those images look at, for example, in a full form. It's a very simple thing. It's a graphic, a raster, and a list. And that's all there is, really. Um, and in general, I can, you know, if you want to see exactly what that guy looks like. So the black and white, the feet here are really at the top here because the raster is the matrix that's printed the other way around. Um, and the best way to use sprites Sorry. Uh, so here's a little flying saucer, and well, it's already running. <clears throat> and so this is exactly what we were looking at before. But uh, to display that sprite now, I've said, uh, you know, move the position and then move it by the speed. And when it's on the left, I put it back on the right, or right on the left, sorry. And um, in this case, I change the color by using a color function. So the color function on a raster uh, enables you to choose what color you want for what kind of values there. And that's pretty simple. Almost there, obviously. The game is almost finished. Uh, <clears throat> this is the example for the, the documentation for raster. Now let's use the keyboard to control the player. So we're going to do the key things here is to use current value of common key and current value of option key in that case. So I want to control whether or not my player is moving to the left or to the right by pressing those keys. And those keys are special because the common keys and the option keys are not trying to do repeat like uh, number keys. So if you just use the events, 
you would get the key. If you try to do this with, uh, for example, uh, z and x, um, you would get z1 and x1, and then they would auto-repeat, but you might want to do this actually faster than the auto-repeat key and, or get control over this. So by using the common keys and the option keys, every time your code runs, it will be able to read the values of those keys. So I have my little player sprite here, and I'm doing the same thing. What am I doing here? It's the same code as before, but if the common key is pressed, I'm going to move the player to the left, minus one, and if it's um, option key, I'm going to move to the right. And I, here I'm using some Mathematica code, max and min, to constrain and clamp my position of my um, player left and right. So let's see what I have. I have here, and I'm pressing the left key, and my little guy at the bottom is moving to the right and to the left. OK, that's, that was simple. Control, we're making good progress. Next one, this is the, we're going to shoot bullets. So this is the player shot. I'm going to have, a, it's the same raster as before, but it's very small. Um, same dynamic module. And here, the only thing that I'm going to do that's slightly different is that I'm going to know if my shot is alive or not. So I have a variable, alive. And if it's alive, I do something. And if it's not alive, I do nothing. Um, and I've added a button here at the bottom of my dynamic module. So I have my graphic, and I use column to make an extra button, button at the bottom. And when I press the button, it's going to say alive true, and it's going to position the bullet. And the bullet will be positioned, in this case, slightly randomly, so it's not too boring. So let's see what it does. Oh, I didn't have a player shot here, sorry. Now if I press fire, can you see the bullet? Yeah. And when it reaches the top, it stops. So one thing we can do is to use a bullet that is slightly more complex. In uh, space invader terms, it's called a squiggly shot. <clears throat> um, and as you display the bullet, you actually change the frame. So in the raster now, rather than always showing the same value, we show a value that's based on the frame number so it will choose one of those to display. Not a little bit more complex, but not much. And now if I shoot here, you can see that my little bullet is animated. So still very simple, small steps. Now collisions and explosions. So an explosion is another sprite like this. And then what we're going to do here is the same thing as the bullet, but when the bullet reaches the end, we're going to replace the display of the bullet by the explosion. And in this case, there's a timer. It's kind of an interesting thing because the bullet moves, but then when you are, you're going to start a timer when the explosion is shown, and when the timer expires, then you hide the explosion. Just a little bit more code, it's still very simple. I think I run that alien shot, good. So now <clears throat> that's the alien shooting, and you see at the bottom, I get an explosion that lasts just a tiny bit of time, half a second, I think. So this is going to be a little bit more complex. Um, what we have, I don't know if you remember, if you played Space Invader, is that when the bullet hits a bunker, the bunker is beating, being destroyed by the bullet. You know, the explosion actually is removing pixels from the, the shield here, or the bunker. So um, <clears throat> what we have to do in this example is we have to measure when the bullet moves. Is it interacting, you know, is it intersecting with the bunker? And if it is, we'll probably explode the bullet, and then we'll have to do some modification to the sprite of the of the shield. Um, but the first question is to know how do we know that the bullet is intersecting? How do we know that those, um, that bullet graphic and the bunkers are intersecting? And it turns out that in Space Invader, it's a pixel accurate uh, calculation that's being made by the way it's calculated. Space Invader was written in uh, 1979 on uh, 8080 code. And it turns out that they, it was a trivial things to do at that time in that calculation. And <clears throat> 
uh, the way to calculate in Mathematica, we can use the, the advantage, rather than having a lot of code that does if and things like that, we can actually use interval arithmetic to know if things intersect or not. So you can define one rectangle as two sets of intervals in X and Y and do the same thing for the bunker. And then you ask interval intersections and it will tell you if those things intersect or not. So that's, what, that's the code we have here. Um, we also then, <clears throat> once we know that the two bitmaps overlap, this is really what the interval and arithmetic have been telling us, then we can extract the little bitmap that's in the intersection um, and then we, that gives us two matrices, really, that are the same size. Therefore, we multiply them, not a dot matrix, but we do a simple multiplication. And if any of those values is non-zero, then we know that those two things overlapped by a pixel. So that's what's done here. You can, you know, it's simple uh, math. And you use bit or, for example, to detect if any of them is non-zero. Um, and that's what the code is doing here. So. We do the, as I said, we do the interval intersections to know if things overlap. If they overlap, we calculate if there is an intersection. Where is it? Here. And if there is an intersection, we'll show something different. So it seems like you want, you know, if you do this, you will want to have some way of controlling this easily. And so this code that detects collisions, now I put that in a manipulate. And then I use a locator, and I can drag my little you know, bullet that's supposed to be moving, and I can decide to show it, you know, and show, so in this case, I show the um, rectangle of intersection in yellow, and, you know, if there is intersection, my bullet will turn red, and it means there's a pixel impact here between the two. The interval, sorry. So that's the value. When the intervals are not colliding, you know, <coughs> That's one interval colliding, and then if both of them are colliding. So the test to know if things collide is whether or not empty interval is in the result of the internal in interval intersection. So that's, you know, that's, I think, the most element, you know, the most important part of the beauty of Mathematica is the fact that as you develop your code, you can make little tests like this that are interactive that prove that your code works properly. And as I did when I, wrote this presentation, discovered I had a bug uh, because the yellow rectangle was a little wrong. But uh, <clears throat> that's exactly why you do this because, you know, I've been writing code for a little while, maybe 30 years, and every line of code I write has a bug in it. It's kind of the way to think about it. So you want those tools to actually make sure the bug is not too stupid. So now we need to damage the sprite. Well, it's pretty much the same business than before, but now in the result, when we have, when we know that things intersect and we find the rectangle of intersections and we know it's intersecting, uh, we can take one of the sprite and actually remove it into from the other. And so uh, it's just a simple shield, you know, a, a simple operation of, um, you know, changing the result of the matrix. So using the scan, I think it's called, what do you call this? Uh, sorry? Span. So this is a really simple way to say, change all the values in this rectangle in the matrix by all those new values, and then you've changed the thing. So it's the same example, same manipulate, pretty much. But this time, I'm showing you know, my things not intersecting, and then the result on the right of the damage. Another, again, same application of manipulate and things like that. You know, five lines of, five lines of code and you're testing your, your case. Now what this doing here? Well, the game is almost finished, really. So moving a fleet of aliens. This is a little more challenging because, um, well, first of all, we have those aliens here. But let me explain what the problem is. It turns out that on that screen where you see those little aliens, those five rows of uh, 11 aliens, that gives you 55 aliens to track. And so as a dynamic, uh, well, for performance reason, when the game was done in 1979, the, the, the processor was capable of only of moving one alien per frame. And so the way that fleet moves is kind of it looks like a bit like a wave because it's one alien is moved and they all move like this. 
and then when they hit the side, they go all down one by one, and that gives a nice effect that's very specific to Space Invader, which means that you really want to control all those guys, not as a group, but as a one by one. Plus, of course, if you shoot them, you want them to disappear, so you really want to have all those aliens controlled by, by one by one. And so the uh, way to do this and to continue to use dynamic is you actually need to have a dynamic variable per alien. Okay? And so the way to do that is to use symbol and two expression to actually generate the string that will be the name of the symbol that you're going to track dynamically. So uh, I'm explaining this in detail here because it's actually a trick that you have to use many, many times when you make games because in games there's very often that there's a pattern or an array of objects. You know, when you do, when I did the breakout game, if you, you know, when 6 came out, I had the same issue, which is every break had to be an independent, um, an independent object. And so, because you want to be able to track programmatically and manage all those variables programmatically, you need to have a way to access them as an array or something like that. So in this case, I can change the alien position on whether or not an alien is alive or um, which frame is shown by an, an alien, an al for an alien, because the aliens, as they move, they change frames, they animate, their little legs go glick, glick, glick like this. And so I have, some, I have some functions to actually access the variables, but then that enables me after that to have just a simple uh, dynamic table to show the aliens, and then Mathematica will take care of the display. So hopefully I've run all of this, yes. So as you see, hopefully here, all of those guys are moving one by one, and you know the, the code to display is still very simple. It's just a table here that says dynamically, you know, if an alien is alive, show it, you know, and if it's alive, well, it's a dynamic of the raster of the sprite because it could be animated and the dynamic of the position. So one thing to understand also in dynamics is that, you know, if you, if you put dynamics inside dynamics, then the interdynamics might actually be the one that fires only. It's not going to necessarily fire the output. And what I mean by that is that um, you might change the position of something which might be a cheap operation for graphics rather than changing the frame uh, or whether or not something is displayed at all, which might be yet another operation, therefore may be more expensive. So one thing that I hope we'll be able to do in the future is to actually you know, uh, mark arrays of uh, things to be dynamic so that I don't have to use the two expression and you could be able to use the same mechanism than arrays. But currently, an array, it's, if you change one element of an array, the whole object by itself is considered to have changed. You know, and that would trigger. So if I was using a regular array to do this and I change the position of one of them, all of them would be updating because Mathematica would say, well, that variable has changed, therefore the dynamic needs to redisplay. But because I have a different variable for every one of the aliens, if I change the position of one or the state of one, it doesn't impact or affect the others. So, um, those are WAV files that you can also find on the internet, and so that's another yet cool thing, as I'm sure all of you know that from, um, you just drag a, a WAV file into your notebook and pop, it shows up like this, and then you can you know, put a variable name in front of it. I don't know if we can hear the sound here. It doesn't seem to have been fixed, but you can hear from my Mac, I'm sure. So there are a bunch of steps. You know, when the aliens move, they kind of make a little bit of a sound every time. This is the sound for destroying things and the flying saucer. <clears throat> so you can actually, you could generate all of those using play in Mathematica. I just that I figured out that those things existed before. So now let me explain one thing that was kind of bad programming in my very, very, in the very, very beginning. And that's really a, a key thing to understand about dynamics and, and really a nice thing that's coming up with version 9, which is in the original example here, it turns out that 
as the programmer, it's quite difficult to control the speed of the ball on the screen in terms of pixels per second. And the reason is because I've decided to move here the position by the speed, you know, to add the speed, but really this is frame rate dependent. So if I, if I was running at 30 frames per second or 50 frames per second, it would be half the speed all of a sudden because, you know, in terms of pixels per second. And of course I can measure time and try to say when was the last time I've shown it and you know, try to multiply that by the time interval and that would be a way to, uh, to do this. But it turns out that it's not a great idea in a dynamic that's going to trigger for the use of ball position to actually change ball position there because you kind of re-trigger itself. You know? And so the way to avoid this is to try to have a cleaner architecture here, which is the use of uh, scheduled task. So scheduled task is a way to have a piece of code that's going to run at a regular interval. And you, in this case, I think I've set up the interval to be 30 hertz. Now, this task, I can start and stop at will, uh, but this task will run in the kernel independently. So now, my graphic is actually simpler because I just say, you know, my dynamic can in fact go and be limited to just the ball position here and the ball speed, but I don't actually change anything inside the graphic itself. So let me run this. So you see the graphic here, and I can change my speed here at the bottom. I have a little slider that changes the speed, but my graphic has been simplified but now that speed is guaranteed. Even if I, you know, even if I um, move the graphic off the screen, you know, which would not display, my ball would be stopping if it was a regular dynamic the way it was done before. Here it's been still moving, you know. And so if you do, you know, usually, you know, if you do a game, you will want to control the speed of things and the interaction. It's something that's important for the tuning of the game and things like that. And so that's the preferred way to do things is to have a task that will fire at a regular interval. And again, that's a new feature in 9. And actually here, if I remove the task, my graphic stays, but now there's nothing that's changing the ball position. So it's actually stopped. I think we've covered everything. Some luck now. So now, this is the complete code for the Space Invader. And <clears throat> pretty highly magnified. So for example, the same way I have my font, you know, though it's a very special font to look um, 17, very 79. Um, this little invaders here, my explosions. Uh, so it's really a beautiful part of um, Although I haven't coded yet, you know, I don't know if you remember, but there used to be a, an actual uh, little trick at the main screens where somebody would reverse the Y. And then my sound that I implemented in my code here. And then everything you've seen pretty much in one cell. And let's see if we can run this. Oops. Sorry. Yeah. Well, that's, and I can stop here. Oops, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 be careful. Don't, no violent death here. <laughs>